Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in the book of Acts. We're looking through God's holy word in a systematic fashion and looking at the Acts in chapter 10 today. Acts chapter 10 and verse 30 is where we're starting, Acts 10 and 30. So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I send to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So now this is the great moment where Peter is going to get to preach the gospel to Cornelius and to his friends and relatives that he's assembled there. And so he's going to tell what's been going on with him. He says, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And the Bible talks about fasting both in Old and New Testaments. It doesn't emphasize it in the New Testament, uh, but it was still practiced in the early church. And the only things we have to be careful to note is that the Lord Jesus made it clear in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that fasting was not to be done ostentatiously. In fact, normally uh, fasting is something that would be done in secret and not to disfigure one's face or to uh, make it look like you're fasting so people would think of your great godliness or something like this. But what fasting, Old or New Testament, indicated, often it was associated with mourning and uh, in the sense of being sad for someone who's died or sad about a tragic situation. And it also expresses a deep seeking after God, a hunger for God, if you will, is how some describe it. So here was Cornelius showing the depth of his search for God, of wanting to know this God and wanting to know what God had for him. And so he was fasting until this hour. Now it's described as four days ago. I don't want to read too much into the number there, but often Bible students have noticed that the number three in scripture is a new beginning. That's the third day was when Jesus was resurrected, was raised from the dead. And of course, four days reminds us of when the Lord Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So uh, that was life from the dead coming to one who it should have been impossible for this man Lazarus after that period of time to be resuscitated. It wasn't like he had just breathed his last and the Lord got there in time to do CPR, which I don't think they had invented yet, or use a defibrillator, which they certainly hadn't invented yet. And this was saying, you know, this was a, a hopeless case with Lazarus. He's been dead four days, they said, Lord, by now he stinks. He's corrupting already the body is succumbing to the decay process and when Cornelius speaks about his experience we might think as well well it's just hopeless old boy you're a gentile you know you're a roman soldier for crying out loud uh, surely you're not going to be saved and yet there's a number of centurions in the new testament that uh, meet the lord jesus and that come to know him as savior and of course, even the centurion presiding over his execution said, truly, this was the son of God. Truly, this is a righteous man. And uh, or maybe the order was the other way, because uh, some gospels give us one portion of the quote, others fill in the rest. But in any case, the man came to realize that the Lord Jesus wasn't a transgressor and wasn't like anybody else he had ever seen die. He had died in a unique way. He died as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, Cornelius says that at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. So here was a man who uh, didn't know the Lord Jesus yet, who wasn't born again by faith in him as yet, and yet he was seeking the Lord. There is, again, a dispensational aspect to this, that he's coming from the dispensation of the law, where he was familiar with the light that had been given before in the Old Testament scriptures. But now things have changed because God has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Lord Jesus has died and risen again from the dead and ascended to heaven and now poured out the Holy Spirit. So he needs this further light. He needs the whole gospel, if you will. And the Lord tells him, your prayer has been heard. What a wonderful thing that God hears prayer. And he says, your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Now, some people think that their prayers and their almsgiving are meritorious. In other words, that when you pray, you're storing up credit before God. And some people, you know, pray the rosary or even in other religions, they pray a certain number of times a day and they think they're earning up merit before God. Similarly, with our charitable donations and specifically our spiritual offerings, when we're giving an offering to a church or to a religious organization, they think that'll get some kind of credit before God. And the Bible doesn't teach that at all, that prayer is calling out to God. And of course, almsgiving in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but nor does it earn you salvation. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot earn uh, your way to heaven based on your good works. And doing good works does not negate the bad works that we've done. We can't efface or wipe out sin by doing righteous things. But nonetheless, the Lord knew the sincerity of this man's search for truth. And that's a wonderful thing that some people that are of a very sensitive nature and conscience, they think, oh, if I don't, you know, get it just right and approach God with just the right words or pray in just the right way, I cannot be saved. But you know, it's not the manner in which you approach or how you say it. It's whom you're approaching. It's this God who has set himself forth to save through faith in his son, the Lord Jesus. And that the Lord Jesus has paid for sin on the cross of Calvary and risen again from the dead to prove that he was the son of God and to prove that his sacrifice was genuine and has been accepted before God. So it's not about our religious ministrations and being done just in the proper way to save us. It's about having a proper faith in the Lord Jesus. In other words, we're trusting in the Lord Jesus to save us. Jesus plus nothing else, not the Lord Jesus and our good works, or not him in our church attendance, or not him in our offerings. It is Christ and Christ alone who saves, and we are trusting in him. We're putting our faith in him to be saved. And so um, Peter was about to give them the wonderful good news, and they were going to be saved, and the evidence of that would be their reception of the Holy Spirit. And it would be not because of these former things that somehow he had stored up credit. But basically, the angel told him that God was paying attention to him, that his prayers hadn't fallen on deaf ears, and how he was living, God knew about. So he said, send therefore, verse 32, to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. So again, I sent for you immediately. He wasn't hesitant to follow God's instruction. It's interesting, too, when the angel tells him who to send for, it's with great specificity. Go to Joppa, ask for Simon, not just any Simon, Simon who's called Peter. That's his nickname, the rock man. His nickname means a rock. Call for him. He's lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner. So just like other scripture, it's specific and prophetic scripture in particular. When we talk about the prophecies of the Bible, it is not vague or general, but it is specific. It gives us exact detail. It tells us what to do. So he sent for him. He sent immediately. So we see the urgency that Cornelius saw in this. And he said, you've done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present. Notice this prepositional phrase. He says, now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. We're not present to see you, Peter. We're not present to concentrate on you. We're not present to think of you as something special. And you remember Peter when uh, he and John healed the man at the beautiful gate back in Acts chapter 3. They said, why do you look on us as by our own power and godliness we've healed this man? It's not us. It's the Lord Jesus and his name. Faith in his name has made this man well. It's the authority of the risen and glorified Christ, the Savior come from God, the one who died 
but who rose again and has ascended back in glory, that's the one who's working through us. It's not us. And Cornelius already perceived that. It's not you. He says we're present before God. We are aware that this is something God has orchestrated and arranged, that God has sent you. And so we realize we're present before God. Now, when you go to a meeting of the local church, when you go into a building where they're preaching the gospel or preaching the word of God in any way, or it might be into a tent or it might be an outdoor meeting, one has to realize this isn't just about men. This isn't just a human endeavor. How we hear the word is being noted in heaven. We are present before God. The Lord said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. And so when we talk about the preaching of the word of God, God is there in the proclamation of his word. And Cornelius recognizes that. We're before God here. We're standing in the presence of God. Though we can't physically see God, we're aware of the reality of God, and it's God speaking to us. Now remember, Paul talked about the Thessalonian believers and how they received the gospel, and he commended them in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians because he said that when they heard the word of God, they received it not as the word of man, but as the what it is, the word of God in truth. So they heard the preaching and they said, this is God's word. We need to heed that. We need to repent and believe that word. And so they were dramatically transformed and from them the word of God sounded out like a trumpet chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians says so the Thessalonians got a hold of it and when we hear the word we have to say you know this is God speaking it's not this man's opinion it's not this man's ideas it's not tradition of men that's been handed down this is something God inspired in other words the word of God is God breathed he's used specifically chosen people to write down this book more than 40 of them over a period of thousands of years from genesis through revelation to write down this book and when we hear that word uh, we should be attentive we should hear it with all our being as it were pay careful attention to what god is saying because we're present before god to hear all the things commanded you by god this isn't you peter it's not your message. It's not what you've invented or come up with. Peter's doctrine doesn't save if it were just of Peter. But these are things commanded by God. This is what God has given to Peter and Peter is giving to them. And anyone who stands up to proclaim the word of God or who in their personal conversation wants to witness for the Lord has to give more than themselves, more than their opinion and their ideas. We have to concentrate on the word of God. That's the key thing, to proclaim the word of God and to show forth who the Lord is by opening up his scriptures to those who hear. If we don't know much else, you know, we may not be able to fully explain doctrine. We may be caught out by somebody's question. We may have to say, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to go and search the scriptures and find out for you and get back to you. We should do that if somebody asks a question we can't answer. But even when we feel we've studied and we've got this down, we realize the power is in the word of God, that it's the word of God that comes in and changes the life. That if somebody receives that word of God, they're receiving God, the word himself. They're receiving the son of God himself, who is that eternal word who is manifest in flesh to bring us to God, who died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and who rose again, according to the scriptures on the third day. And so we preach this word. As Paul said, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's our message. That's what we have to be about. When people hear us, they should know this is a person of the book. This is, a, as some Christians have been called in the past, this is a walking Bible. You ask them what they believe, and they're going to go to the Bible and tell you from the Bible what they believe. And so this good news was not, Peter's ideas or Peter's opinions or man's ideas. It was God's. It was what God had commanded Peter to speak to Cornelius and his fellows. And Peter and that household were wide open, as we'll see, to hear it. What a wonderful thing when you come to a group of people or even to an individual that the Holy Spirit has already prepared to receive the word. Now, we should preach the word 
uh, as Second Thessalonians, sorry, Second Timothy chapter four verse two says, "Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season." We had to preach it with that urgency that says, "I'm going to proclaim it." And if they receive it and we get fruit, so to speak, people come to the Lord. Great, praise the Lord. But even when we don't see the fruit, we may just be planting a seed for some other Christian to water and for God to bring to fruition later on down the line. Now, whatever it is, though, we have to be faithful in preaching the word. The church cannot cease the proclamation of the word. And we as individual believers, whether we are gifted to teach or to preach the gospel as evangelists or to be exhorters, or we have none of those gifts and we say, I'm not a public speaker. No, but you're still called to be a witness. You're still called to tell others what God has commanded you. And what's God commanding? Well, Acts 17 says to us, for example, but God commands all men everywhere to repent. So we have to tell people, God has told them to turn around. They're going the wrong way. God has told them they're wrong about themselves. They're not okay. They're sinners under the judgment of God. They're on their way to destruction, to hell, and eventually the lake of fire. And they need to be saved. Turn to the Lord Jesus. Receive him as your Lord and Savior because he died for your sins and rose again for your justification. That's what we're to preach to men. May we be faithful in doing it. Thank you for listening.